Hello and welcome to Studio 289. I'm Michael Myers. We want to welcome everyone who's with us today. We're streaming this webinar live on Hopin. It's also going out on LinkedIn Live and on YouTube. We invite you to utilize any of those platforms to send us questions because we'll have, we'll have a little bit of time at the end of today's webinar to answer any of those questions that you sent in. So why are we here today? Well, I want to introduce you to my friend, Nasink, because this guy is going to be critical in you for determining the best practice dawning sequences uh, for your facility. When we look at what specifically the new chapter says, so this chapter was published on November the 1st, 2022. It's going to go live on November the 1st, 2023. Section 3.2 states that the order of hand washing and garbing depends on the placement of the sink. The order of garbing must be determined by the facility and documented in that facility's SOPs. Section 3.3 that deals with garbing goes on to say that the required garb the manner of storage and the order of garbing must be determined by the facility and documented in their SOPs. So that's why we've come to together today with you is to talk about five, the five most common scenarios where a sink might be placed inside of a clean room or an SCA. And we're going to go through the best practice scenarios for those. And what are they? One would be the clean sink on the clean side of the line of demarcation in a clean room suite. Second scenario is you've still got a clean room sink, but the sink could be on the dirty side of the line of demarcation. Perhaps you've got a clean room seat suite, but your sink is located outside. And then also we've got two scenarios involving uh, uh, segregated compounding areas or SEA, one with the sink be being located inside of the room where the SEA is located. And the second being a sink, if you've got your sink located outside of the room where your SEA is located. So we're going to run through those five scenarios today. I want you to know that we're actually not going to be teaching you how to don and doff. That could be a different webinar. Contact has lots of resources. We've got a team of blue shirts that can come out and train you on how to properly don sterile gloves. Today, we're focused on coming up with that protocol, that procedure, that sequence for donning based on where we're going to be placing this sink. But regardless of where this sink is, no matter where this sink is, some things are never going to change. What are those things that are never going to change? First of all is hand hygiene. The process by which we wash our hands isn't going to change. And by that, I mean, you must run your fingers and use a nail pick to clean underneath your fingernails before you start the true hand hygiene or hand washing procedure. So once I've cleaned under all of my nails with under warm running water with a nail pick, then I need to wash my hands. I'm going to use soap and I'm going to lather all the way up to my elbows and wrists and make sure that I properly do hand hygiene. So that's never going to change. We're also never going to have the way our head and beard covers change. So where I go, no matter which stage I'm going into that room, we must have true head coverings um, that we'll be using inside of that room. In this picture you see here, I love this picture because it actually shows something done improperly. Notice at the back lower of my neck, the bouffant is tilted up by the elastic band of my mask. And that exposes some hair and exposed skin along the back of my neck. So if you're using a traditional bouffant like the one you've seen here, there are alternatives that you can use, sort of a full face covering mask that will prevent you having any of those hairs that wisp up on the back of your neck. Another thing that's never going to change is donning our gown. We're always going to be donning our gown sort of at the end of that gowning process in the ante room. Before we enter that buffer room, that last thing we do before we don our sterile gloves. So that's never going to change. And lastly, donning sterile gloves. That's never going to change. The process for properly donning a sterile glove is never going to change. So just keep in mind, those five things aren't going to change. But what we're going to talk about today are the different sequences, the order in which we might do those things based on the placement of this sink. So I'm going to have Chris Ebert, one of our studio folks, come in and help me move this sink over. We're going to start out with what's the most common placement of the sink that you may have. And that's going to be the sink located on the clean side of the line of demarcation inside of your clean room suite. <coughs> Thank you, Chris. 
This is great. So we're going to really utilize Studio 289 today. We can build this room out. Right now, we've got it built out as an anteroom so we can go through this donning and doffing exercises. If we roll primary engineering controls in here, we can do teaching um, of, of both hazardous CPECs or non-hazardous PECs that we can teach proper uh, decontamination or cleaning inside of a clean room. But let's start with this most common scenario that I think most people out there may have. I do know we're going to have a poll question going out to folks in the field asking you where your sink is placed. So look for that in the hop-in platform and be sure to answer it. So this most common traditional layout is our sink that's located on the clean side of that line of demarcation. So we're going to come in, we're going to start obviously in each of these scenarios, we start before you begin your shift, go to the restroom so you don't have to keep coming back in and out of the room. You want to make sure you've tied your hair back if that's appropriate and that you clean your eyeglasses as necessary. So the second step is you're going to be entering the handy room. Hopefully you've got some storage here for your face mask and your bouffant. You'll have, want to have yourself a mirror here. So again, as I'm putting on that bouffant, I want to make sure that I'm not getting any of those wisps of hair out of the back of my neck. Second, next stage, I've got on a, a hairnet and a face mask as I'll grab booties. I sit down on my gowning bench one foot at a time as I place them across, my, across the line of demarcation. Make sure you get your folks a gowning bench. I've seen a lot of facilities where I did just have a line of demarcation on the floor and someone's sort of hopping around and trying to balance themselves to get their booties on. They're going to slip. That's going to lead to an injury. So make sure you go ahead and install a gowning bench or a, or a, a gowning seat so they can get easily across that line of demarcation. So now the person would have on their booties, their hairnet and the face mask. Next thing in the sequence is full hand hygiene. Again, 30 seconds, wrist all the way up to our elbows. We would have started with finger picks, running water under our nails. Make sure we dry our hands with low lint towels. The chapter, the new chapter specifically forbids the use of air dryers. So you want to make sure that you're using a low lint towel. And at this point, I would come and don my gown. Hopefully you've got your gown stored in a way that's far enough from the wet sink to prevent splashing in a way that protects those gowns. Now that I've got my gown, it's the last stage I can do is use my waterless alcohol-based hand rub before I don those sterile gloves. So again, that's our most common scenario. We're going to come into the room, do hairnet face mask. We're going to sit down on our gowning bench one foot at a time across the line of demarcation. We'll perform hand hygiene here on the clean side of the line of demarcation, dry our hands, We'll put on our gown and then use our hand sanitizer, waterless-based hand rub before we put on our sterile gloves. So that's our first most common scenario. Our second scenario is going to be with the sink on the dirty side of the line of demarcation. And Chris and Brandy are going to help me move both the sink and the hand towel dispenser for that. You know, the original 2008 chapter, or not the original, but the currently enforceable 2008 chapter, does call out that sink location on the clean side of the line of demarcation. So that's why most folks have their sinks located there. Now, I'm certainly not advocating anyone do a construction project, but if you're going to be building a clean room in the next few years, I'd invite you to consider this scenario we're about to run through with the sink on the dirty side of the line of demarcation, still in my clean room suite, still in my ante room. But if I put my sink on the dirty side of the line of demarcation, my water source is now further away from my buffer room. My water source is further away from that primary in, in, engineering control with my critical sites. So just for that simple fact of placing my sink on that dirtier side of the line of demarcation, I'm going to be able to get that water source further away from my primary engineering control. So let's talk about this scenario. It's going to be very similar at the beginning. We're going to visit the restroom tie back our hair, clean our uh, eyeglasses if necessary. And we're going to enter the ante room, don our uh, face mask, our hair net. We're going to then come to the sink and we're going to perform hand hygiene. All right. We've now done our full normal hand hygiene procedure. And at this point, I'm going to grab shoe covers. I'll put them down and one foot across the line of demarcation at a time. Nothing's changed there. And I come over to don my gown. Now I've just, I washed my hands when I was over there. I sat down on that bench and I've kind of touched my feet when I was putting on those shoe covers. So before I don my gown, we've got an additional waterless alcohol-based hand rub step. So I would apply 
waterless based hand rub to my hands, don my gown, and then I would apply alcohol based hand rub for a second time before donning my sterile gloves. It's always going to be that last step before I don my sterile glove. But in this scenario, we've added one. So if you just think logically, we washed our hands in the sink, but then we sat down at this bench to get across it. We had to touch our feet, putting on those booties one at a time. And that's where um, we recommend best practice that you do this additional waterless hand sanitizer step before putting on that gown. Um, and then you're gonna go in. The 2008 chapter actually specifically said you must don your sterile gloves in the buffer room. The new chapter says it needs to be in a classified space. So in theory, if you had room in your ante room, you could don your sterile gloves in this space or in that buffer room. Just make sure that last step before you don the gown, you apply the hand rub and then right after donning the gown, put that hand rub again on um, uh, before you don your sterile gloves. So those are the two scenarios that we've got with our sinks located inside of the clean room suite. There is one more scenario that we wanna talk about that involves a clean room and that's if a clean room at sink is located outside of your clean room. <coughs> Excuse me. So we are going to have uh, Daniel bring up a, a, a slide here that we can talk about. So I just want you to visualize if that sink is going to be located outside of the clean room, the additional steps that I'm going to need to take to get into that room. So the first thing I still want to do is make sure I go to the restroom before I start my shift. I want to tie my hair, clean my personal glasses, um, and then I'm going to perform hand hygiene. So Chris has brought the sink back over here. So this would just be, imagine if I'm outside of the clean room here, I'm going to be performing hand hygiene outside of this space before I even bother going into that clean room space. So once I've performed hand hygiene, again, I've got to make sure I've done my nail pick underneath running water, a full 30 seconds with my wrists, uh, hands and wrists up to my elbows, dry my hands with low lint towels, Hand hygiene is complete, but now I'm standing outside of the clean room. So I want to make sure I enter the uh, ante room and apply alcohol-based hand rub to my hands and wrist. I put an asterisk on number three here because if you've got an automated door, if you just wave your hand and it automatically opens, you might could skip, skip that third step. But certainly if you're having to manipulate a door to get in that space, before I go in there and start putting on head and face covers, I want to make sure I apply that alcohol hand rub. So I've gone into the room through a manual door. Let's say I touch the door. I want to go in. I want to make sure I apply my waterless alcohol-based hand rub. At that point, I can put on my face mask covers. Then I'm going to sit down and do my shoe covers one at a time across the line of demarcation. Again, I was just sitting on that bench at line of demarcation. I've touched my hands. So before I put on that gown, I want to do another application of the waterless alcohol-based hand sanitizer. That's done, then I can don my gown, and then the final application of that waterless alcohol-based hand sanitizer before I don my sterile gloves. So those three scenarios will take you through anyone that's compounding with a clean room suite, whether my sink is gonna be located outside of the clean room in the general pharmacy area, whether it's gonna be located in my clean room on my clean side of my line of demarcation, or on the dirty side of the line of demarcation. The last two scenarios we want to talk with you today involve segregated compounding areas or SCAs. You know, not a lot changes for your cleaning frequencies and some of the garbing requirements if you're going to be compounding your know, category one drugs inside of an SCA. So if uh, you could pull that slide up, perfect. We have this great little animation here, or excuse me, drawing that sort of shows just a very basic. Uh, so that is actually the clean room suite place. Uh, outside. So that is the sink placed outside of the room that we were just talking about. If you could pull up, there we go. So this is a segregated compounding area with a sink inside of that clean room. So the first thing, again, is no different than if I were compounding in a clean room. I need to visit the restroom. I want to tie my hair, clean my personal glasses. And at that point, I can enter the segregated compounding area. I want to don my face, head, and beard covers outside of that perimeter line. So I'm on the dirty side of that perimeter line. And I'm going to perform hand hygiene at that sink. I want to make sure the sink is located on that dirty side of the perimeter line and also away from that primary engineering control. Once I've done hand hygiene, I can don my gown. I put my shoe covers on one at a time across that perimeter line. And the last thing I want to do is apply alcohol-based hand rub to my hands and wrists 
before I don those sterile gloves. There's also a scenario with a segregated compounding area if you've got your sink located outside of the uh, SCA. So as you see here, the, their sink on this drawing is located outside. So again, step one, as always, they need to make sure they visit the restroom. They wanna tie their hair back and clean their personal glasses. Make sure you perform hand hygiene. Again, you're gonna be outside of the room when you perform that hand hygiene. So you wanna enter the SCA, you're likely gonna be doing that through a manual door. So the first thing I do after I've pulled that manual door open is I wanna apply uh, that hand rub to my uh, wrists, uh, uh, hands and wrists to clean that. Then I will don my face mask, head and beard cover, apply alcohol-based hand sanitizer again before uh, putting on my gown. Then we're gonna don our shoe covers one foot at a time across the perimeter line. And then that last step is going to be applying an alcohol-based hand rub to my hands and wrists before I don my sterile gloves. You know, that's always going to be that last step again. Keep in mind of applying this waterless alcohol-based hand rub. One thing to note is the 2008 chapter had language about persistent activity, that that waterless alcohol hand rub had to have persistent activity. And sometimes it was fine to, to, difficult to find that language on a particular product. So that language was removed from the 2022 revision. So it says you just need to source yourself a waterless alcohol-based hand rub. So we went through five common scenarios with you right there. Um, and this document is available. Rachel will show you in just a minute how you're able to download some of these documents. It's HCA 030, lists all five of these scenarios. And we highly recommend that you grab this resource so that you can help develop the protocols in your facility. As far as more in-depth training, Contact has lots of resources. Again, today's webinar was sort of short and sweet and to the point. We wanted to talk about where this sink is located and how that will determine the dawning sequence in your facility. We can, Contact's got a team of blue shirts that can come out to your facility and train in full hand hygiene and garbing for non-hazardous and hazardous scenarios. We've got this incredible studio here that we can utilize to perform webinars. If you've got multiple sites and would like us to perform a webinar individually for your multiple locations, we can certainly work on that and, and help train your facilities, even if they are spread out. So with me giving you just a little bit of that, I'm gonna invite Rachel to come in and she's gonna tell us more about some of these other resources that are available to you. Hey everybody, Rachel Hansen here with Contact Healthcare Marketing. Just wanted to give y'all um, a little sneak peek to some of our preview, uh, to some of the resources that we have available for you. So first of all, you should see on your screen right now, contactusp.com. This is a great new resource that we have for all of you who are navigating USP 797 and so on. Just wanted to call out a really neat section that we have called the critical cleaning zone. Here you're able to hover over some of these hot spots and when you click on them, um, some really interesting tidbits here for you, things to consider um, that may be helpful to your practices. If you scroll on down, you'll be able to see uh, some of our resources here for the different chapters. So 797, 800, as well as 825. If I click here on 797, you'll see a dedicated page for all things 797, including one of the items that Michael had mentioned earlier, uh, a quick little guide here for all things that has changed since the new regulations were released. So clicking on that link, you will head over to this page where you can download this PDF. Everything here in these boxes uh, are from the chapter, and then you'll see neat sections that talk about context solutions. So right here, this section right here, just gives you an idea of some of our products that uh, we can help you uh, or support you with. So with that, we've got a couple of polls that we had um, sent out earlier, and I'm gonna pass this over to Daniel to get some of our polling results. Daniel? Yes, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the control room of Studio 289. And we did run one poll just to ask people, where is your sink located? So 81% of everyone, that's actually a huge number in our polling. So 81% say that their sink is located on the clean side of the anteroom. Uh, coming in second, 
with 6.8%. So there's a pretty big gap. 6.8% say the dirty side of the ante room. 5.7% say outside the room in which the SCA is located. 3% say inside the room in which the SCA is located. And 2% say outside the clean room suite. So there is a pretty big portion of guys of people um, using the clean side of the ante room. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Rachel to talk about one more resource before we get to our Q&A section. Rachel? All right. Thanks, Daniel. So coming up March, March 25th to the 29th, we will be at NHIA in D.C. And both Michael and Mark will be presenting there. So do you guys want to tell me a little bit about what y'all will be doing there? Michael? Sure. I'm going to be doing wearing several hats. So NHIA does a really neat thing called the Sterile Compounding Clinic where folks who've registered can actually go and as a part of the trade show, go put their hands on equipment and get trained by industry experts. So I'm going to be a faculty member there specifically dealing with hazardous decontaminations of CPECs. On Tuesday morning, I'm going to be giving a presentation on best practices for cleaning and disinfecting a secondary uh, engineering control, the, the clean room suite itself. And then I'll also be leading roundtable discussions on Monday and Tuesday nights about residue uh, removal. Very neat. And what about you, Mark? Tell us a little bit about what you'll be doing. Well, I'm uh, kind of introducing Michael. I'll be on Monday and uh, talking about some basics of the changes in 797, including these new frequencies of daily disinfection versus this new, perhaps new concept for some, sporicidals. Then getting into all things sterile, now that we require sterile disinfectants to be used in the PECs. Uh, then I get a little bit into some other stuff around dwell times, like how do I actually know a surface is wet? And then finally finishing up with a little bit of microbiology uh, regarding how to deal with isolates that you get from environmental monitoring uh, and what to do if those don't show up on your label. So also sporting a little NHIA uh, uh, scrubs from years past, but uh, that's another great asset of coming and joining the critical, uh, the sterile compounding clinic is you do get to leave with some scrubs. That's awesome. Well, we hope to see you there. And with that, shall we get to some of our questions today? Sure. So I'm going to head back over here to my computer station. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Mark. And we're going to answer some of the questions that you guys submitted to us. <clears throat> and this came in, some of these came in in advance and some of them came in via the hop in platform. So Patricia asked me, what garb must be sterile versus non-sterile? That's a great question. What we talked about today is category one and category two compounding. So category one is mostly going to be done in an SCA. So for category one or two, you could do that in a clean room. When you move into category three compounding, I, I didn't want to sort of muddy the waters in today's webinar because it's a wholly different uh, department. So when you get into category three compounding, all of your garb must be sterile. So from head to toe, all the garb you're wearing has got to be sterile. You can't have any exposed skin. So you'd have to wear, you know, full head coverings like this versus a bouffant. You know, when you move into category three, it really is sort of a significant difference. So that's really where sterile garb comes into play. For category one and category two, two compounding, only your gloves must be sterile. So sterile gloves always one, two, or three. And then category three is just going to be sterile all garb. Everything's going to have to be sterile for category three. Do you have a policy or template for donning garb that could be revised to fit each different hospital's need? Yes, I think that HCA 30 document, Rachel showed you uh, how you can download that from our USB experience website is available. And uh, make sure, excuse me, I'm going to grab a glass of water. If you download that document, it's going to show you the five scenarios we went detailed today, and you can use that to help develop your protocol. Um, any information for garbing for HD compounding would be helpful. So hazardous compounding is your scenarios aren't really going to change for how you get into the room. You're just going to be doubling up. So obviously when I sit down um, at that line of demarcation on my gowning bench, I'm going to be putting on two booties on each foot as I place them across the line of demarcation. Once I've completed hand hygiene, I'm gonna be putting on a second gown, a chemo gown over top of my IV frock. And then once I enter the buff room, I'm gonna be donning two pairs of sterile gloves, double gloving. 
Some of the biggest differences for HD compounding deals with the doffing process. We do have a, a video that's available uh, training on our Contact U platform that deals with HD doffing. It's a little uh, too complex to get into right now. Um, but for the dawning part, nothing's really going to change as far as that sequencing where I might be applying my waterless alcohol based hand sanitizer. I'm just going to be double booty, double gown and double glove. All right. If someone in the IV room is wearing a bunny suit instead of hospital scrubs, do they need to wear a gown over the bunny suit if they're not compounding? Sometimes maintenance has to wear a bunny suit to address a mechanical issue in the IV room. Do they need to put a gown on over the bunny suit? No, they do not. A bunny suit alone is efficient enough. It's, it's either or. So if they're wearing a full bunny suit that and it's a clean room, you know, the material is clean room compatible. That's acceptable. They would not need to, to wear a gown over that. Are reusable gowns allowed? And if so, what are the requirements for laundering? So yeah, reusable gowns are allowed. Um, they're not ideal. They certainly aren't a best practice. It says that if you are going to use relaunder gowns, you must have a validated laundry cycle. And it's difficult to, to really tell, uh, to, to find a validated laundry. There are some hospital accreditation uh, organizations that do accreditation specifically around hospital laundry. So you would want to, to research and find out which one of those uh, accreditations they had so that you could truly validate that process on any relaunderable gowns. Um, the best practice preferred would be single use and disposable. You can reuse your gown for one shift. So if I were leaving the buff room, I can hang up uh, my gown on the clean or my frock on the clean side of the line of demarcation. I'm going to throw away my hairnet, face mask, my gloves and booties. Come back later in the day, I can reuse that IV frock for one shift. So that is allowed. Gloves donned and removed inside the hood or out for hazardous and non. So for non-hazardous, you're going to remove those gloves outside of the PEC because you don't want to have any exposed skin. The new chapter says no exposed skin in my ISO 5 primary engineering control. So if I was just doing non-hazardous, had on one layer of gloves, I'd want to remove my hands from that primary engineering control before I remove them. If I was doing hazardous compounds, I'm going to have on two layers of gloves. The outside gloves are likely contaminated with HD residue. So I want to remove those in that ISO 5 CPEC, place those outside gloves inside of my trace waist. I'm now then still wearing the bottom layer of gloves that's protecting that CPEC from my exposed skin. I can remove those hands and then remove those gloves inside of there. <coughs> Excuse me. Can I use tape for a line of demarcation? Is that okay? It's not ideal. You really want to have, there's, there's floors available now. You can do different colors, a, a seam in that welded vinyl floor um, that needs to be permanent and won't be affected by any mopping chemistries or traffic across there. Tape is, tape is just not ideal for that, for that line of demarcation. Um, and then another question came out about the different garbing requirements for category one, category two, and category three. Um, again, category one and category two are what we focused on today. Category one uh, drugs have a short beyond use date. They have the least amount of control. So that's typically what's going to be compounded in a, in a uh, SCA. If you're going to be doing category two drugs, that requires a classified environment. So you're going to be working in a clean room suite for category two. Category three, those give you those long beyond use dates, those extended. So in exchange for those longer beyond use dates, the compounding expert committee put a, a pretty big burden on those folks that they had to meet using all sterile products at all times, sterile garb, sterile disinfectants, no exposed skin. So their manner of garbing changed. The frequency of, of sporicidal application, the frequency of cleaning was increased for those category three compoundings. But for specifically for, for our garbing today, we were focused on category one and category two. And I do believe we've got one more question that came on and we do have just another minute for it. Do you have recommendation for eyeglass cleaning procedure as well as some, yeah, some agents damage the lens. That's a great point, Patty. So when you're cleaning those eyeglasses, you really only wanna use your disinfectant or your alcohol on the frames itself. Now people are constantly sort of grabbing their glasses, you know, push them back up on the bridge of their nose, they rip them off to make a dramatic point. These eyeglasses need to be cleaned and disinfected. But if you use a, 
a harsh disinfectant or alcohol on the lens itself, these lenses come with high tech coatings on them. Those can get affected. So we recommend that you clean the frames with a disinfectant and that you then use just a lens cleaner for cleaning the lenses. And uh, last question that we've got time here, uh, the conference info for the sterile compounding clinic uh, is too late to register. We'll make sure we get that info to you, uh, uh, Diantha, that asked that question. So I wanna thank you guys uh, today for joining us for our webinar. Again, we had a little bit narrow focus. We didn't wanna come in and teach you uh, how to actually don all these garbs. We wanna help you determine the best practice sequence for what, for what order you're gonna put on Dawn based on the placement of this sink. Thank you so much, Chris. Yeah, it's our buddy here at the sink. He's the star of the show. He's gonna be the star of your show along with our waterless alcohol-based hand sanitizer and where I'm gonna be applying that throughout the different stages. I wanna thank some people that made today possible. First of all, our amazing studio staff in the control room. You saw Daniel in there earlier. He's in there working with Ryan. We've got some of our marketing folks. And then Chris and Brandy that were out here helping move, move things around on Studio 289 so that we could bring you today's webinar. Ryan's on the big camera jib over here. That's our new, very cool piece of equipment. So thank you for joining us. If you asked a question that we didn't get to, we will make sure that we reach out to you. Get a copy of this HCA 030 to help develop your protocols. And we'll see you at the next webinar.